On May the 8th, 1931, a sensational trial took place at the Berlin Central Criminal Court. The star witness was the leader of Germany's fastest growing political movement. Two years before he came to power, Hitler was summoned to Berlin by a young Jewish lawyer called Hans Litten, who forced him to account for the murderous violence of his followers in the city. What Germany requires is a revolution, which means a mental revolution, a spiritual rebirth. Who are you addressing? The court. He's taken on the task of cross-examining this extremely dangerous man, at this point, probably the most dangerous man in the world. I believe the court can hear you quite comfortably. Yes, it can. It is not necessary to shout or to harangue. An extreme anti-Semite, a brilliant young Jew. It was Hitler's worst nightmare. This guy is my uncle. I was my uncle. I, it's, it's so close, and yet it's so miles away. At stake in that Berlin courtroom was Hitler's political future. His brutal methods, his totalitarian ambitions were all exposed by the young lawyer. The acquisition of total power can make a dictator's rise to power seem irresistible. It never is, and it wasn't for Hitler. This is the story of one brave man's attempt to stop him. Eden Palace depositions. Mm -hmm. The shootings? I know. You always say, prepare the next case as soon as we've won the last one. I say that. You do? I must learn to relax. So, how did you like The man who up? challenged Hitler in the courts was just 27 years old. His name was Hans Litten. He was a poor man's lawyer, and he was a rebel. Hans was born into a family whose Jewish father had converted to Christianity. Hans converted back again. He adored his mother, Irmgard, and took from her a lifelong love of art and poetry but he had no time for the bourgeois world he was born into, and he abandoned that as well. In Berlin, he lived with like-minded friends, including his oldest friend, Max Furst, a socialist, a Jew, and a carpenter. Whatever Hans achieved in life, whatever dangers he faced, Max Furst was with him, giving him support. They were opposite characters somehow. Max was practical and sociable, and Hans was intellectual, going through work very, very deep. The third member of the family was 19-year-old Margot Meisel, whose uncle, the composer Edmund Meisel, had recently scored Berlin, <laughs> Symphony of a City. Both men loved Margot. Max captured her heart, and Hans got the consolation prize. Margot became his legal assistant. She was very spontaneous and sharp. She was very sharp, a, a real Berliner tongue, like knives. And she would go to the end for everything she believed in. Ah. It's so incredible what these three people got through by living together in community, sharing the flat, sharing the life, sharing their political struggle. I had this crazy idea. Did you, Hans? Yes, I did, actually. Hans was kind of the third people in this matrimonial situation, he was always present, sharing even the little family life. All our life, Hans was in our life. And I remember him as being my second father. And what I remember when I was a little child, I used to call him the big man with the glasses. 
he was always with us somehow. He was walking side by side with my parents all their lives. And my parents would say, if they explained something to us about politics, and Hans Litten would say this. The days in Berlin are like some fantastic memory and, and memories coming back. And the smell and everything, I know this place. The Berlin of Hans Litten and Max and Margot Fürst was one of the great world cities. The only goose steppers were the chorus girls. The only arms raised in salute were those designed to stop traffic. It was also home to a vast industrial workforce whose votes were split between the Social Democrats and increasingly the Communist Party. Throughout Germany, throughout Europe, the city enjoyed its reputation as Red Berlin. This was Weimar Berlin. Into the city, into these lives, the anti-Semites of the Nazi party came in late 1926. The Nazis were a small Bavarian movement, provincial and insignificant. To make them national and a genuine force in German politics, Adolf Hitler needed to conquer Berlin. On November the 9th, 1926, he sent his lieutenant, Josef Goebbels, to the capital. Goebbels was a man who looked at clouds and convinced himself they were shaped into swastikas. He was a sycophant who told Hitler, I love you because you are both great and simple at the same time. But here too was a man who knew that political objectives could be achieved with guns and knives. Goebbels' arrival in the capital would change the face of Berlin. Goebbels was an inspired choice to be the party boss in Berlin. This was at a time, 1926, 1927, the Nazis were trying to reach out to a constituency they hadn't reached before. They were trying to reach urban industrial workers, and Berlin, of course, was the center for that. It was a city dominated by the left-wing political parties, and Goebbels knew that the Nazi challenge was to get attention in Berlin. The instrument that Goebbels used to conquer Berlin was the SA, the brown-shirted stormtroopers. These men were heavily armed, with cast-off weapons from the First World War, and they were led by officers who made a cult out of violence. Goebbels knew they needed headlines, and they would get headlines with violence, and they would get headlines with provocation, with moving into the neighborhoods where the communists, in fact, were strongest in stirring up trouble. And so what the Nazis would do is move into a neighborhood, and they would set up taverns for their stormtroopers. His men came to this neighborhood, quite late in 1930, organized in a tavern. And they chose the tavern because it was quite near to this red neighborhood. That's the reason. They went to all the red neighborhoods and uh, had their taverns there. This was a socialist neighborhood. A lot of the workers, or most of them, voted communist or social democrat. There were about uh, 30,000 people living here in this very small area. And the uh, Nazis called this, uh, this was a red swamp area. And they wanted to clear it up. Ah! 
die sind immer erst gekommen mit einem Auto rausgestehen und dann bumm, 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 im Lokal rein. Ja, das war die Faschistenmasche. Haben unsere Leute, Deutsch und so weiter, Amore, ja. Die sind drin gekommen. Wir sind eben jeden Lokalen hier ja, haben drin geschossen. Das waren die Faschisten damals. Hundreds of young communists still said, the only way to deal with the Nazi is to uh, beat him up. One uh, said, yesterday we talked to Nazis for four hours, and the consequence was at the end we had to beat him up. That's the only way to deal with Nazis. Hans Litten was pitched right into the middle of the struggle. Are you two lost? I don't mean philosophically, you're obviously that. He was the lawyer that the left turned to when they were in trouble. He prosecuted Nazis accused of attacking anti-fascists, and he defended anti-fascists accused of attacking Nazis. That is all, Mensch, little, prima, prima. I know him personally. Yeah, but he had a good name by us. This work brought Hans into direct opposition to the Berlin stormtroopers, and one group in particular, Storm 33. Mord Storm, yeah. Das kann man wirklich sagen. Das war der Sturm von Charlottenburg. Der Sturmführer war Hahn. Der hieß Hahn, der rote Hahn, haben wir immer gesagt. Das ist mir sehr geläufig, weil wir von Berlin immer sagten, nein, da müssen wir immer hingehen, da müssen wir mal aufräumen. And sometimes they marched along the street and were singing, we are the Murdered Stormtroopers 33. They were proud of the name given to them by left papers. It was the men of Storm 33 who were destined to give the battle for Berlin a new twist of viciousness. On a dark winter night in 1930, a group of armed and drunken men from Storm 33 walked 200 yards from their headquarters to a popular left-wing social club there was a dance in progress being put on by a communist hiking club called Van der Valka. This is happening at the Eden Dance Palace. And the uh, SA heard about this, and they rushed to the Eden Dance Palace. The Eden Dance Palace, in the heart of Charlottenburg. The events here on November the 22nd, 1930, would set Adolf Hitler and Hans Litten on a collision course. The dancing has long gone from Eden, but the building still exists. Today, it is part of Klaus Kasper's hardware store. Nachdem ich das gehört habe, ja. dass Sie sich also doch für die Berliner äh, Historie und vielleicht auch gerade Charlottenburg jetzt hier interessieren, ja. habe ich etwas aufwendig gemacht, was Sie nachher auch gerne mitnehmen können. Sehr schön. Und zwar, ja. die Räumlichkeiten sind im Wesentlichen auch soweit noch vorhanden von den, das ist also der Kellerbereich. Bierkeller. Genau. Ja, also da wurde dann es gab vier Obergeschosse. Zweite bis das vierte. ist das Wohnhaus. Das Wohnhaus, ja. Das ist das Wohnhaus nach vorne. Und das ist dann der Bereich, der uns interessiert. Ja. Hier sind die SA-Leute rein. Ah, ja. Und haben dann hier im Vorbereich. Aha. Harold Marpe has studied the Eden Dance Palace atrocity, but this is the first time he's been here. Und äh, haben dann nur, äh, sich versucht zu wehren. Mhm, mhm. Ich sehe das jetzt zum ersten Mal, ja. Ja. Ich habe eine Tatortskizze von der Polizei. Das heißt, hier ist die Durchfahrt. Wir ja. kommen auf den Hof. Ja. Hier ist Treppen, Treppen ja, ja, das wird dann, Genau, das wird dann wohl hier dieser Und dann, Treppenaufgang sein. Hier. A lot of these stormtroopers were armed. Everybody had a knife and lots of them had guns, pistols, Mauser, Parabellum. There were thousands of weapons from World War I, so it was no problem. If you spend 20 marks, you got a gun at this time. Well, it's a strange experience to be here. I read a lot about it, never been there. Read books and went to the archives. Now I'm here for the first time. And I try to imagine how it was on November 1930, on this very day here. 
I look in his face. He was one of the stormtroopers. This guy is called Berlich, and he lived just around the corner. These are the guys who took part, stormtroopers. His name was Hans Majkowski, and the Nazis named the street after him. Everybody in Germany knew him. I have lots of photos of communists. Now I always think, if I don't know who these people are, do I see a difference? It's uh, difficult to answer. You can't judge by, by the faces, I guess. If you know he's a Nazi, you see his brutal face. But if you don't know, it would be difficult to say. Is he left wing? Is he right wing? What, what was this man? All these guys were, most of them, were unemployed. The father, fathers had fought in World War I. A lot of them died in war. I think in, in other countries, things didn't go this way, didn't happen this way. In Germany, it uh, came to absolutely collapse of civilization. And these guys were the ones who did it, these young men. Storm 33's assault on the Eden Dance Palace came at a critical time in the career of Adolf Hitler. Only two months before, in the September elections, the Nazi party had made an astonishing breakthrough. Six and a half million votes had catapulted the Nazis from a lunatic fringe group to a major party, commanding 107 seats in the Reichstag. Almost literally overnight, Hitler had become a major figure in German politics. He was trying to turn himself from being sort of the, the demagogue, the back street orator that he had sort of been known for through the 1920s, the man who had led a coup attempt in 1923. He was trying to reinvent himself as a statesman. Hitler had gone on to swear on oath that he and his party had turned their backs on violence. This appealed to Hitler's new friends in the middle classes, but outraged his paramilitaries in the SA. Here was Hans Litten's great opportunity. Hans had been hired as the private prosecutor for the victims of the Eden Palace shooting. Call Hitler as a star witness, and you can redefine the scope of your trial. Hans's audacious move was to subpoena Hitler as a witness in the trial, believing it would be impossible for the Nazi leader to defend the accused brown shirts without frightening off his millions of law-abiding middle-class supporters. It would be the greatest show in Berlin. His stormtroopers in the dock. His new pals, the rich financiers in the gallery, both thinking they own Hitler. You bring them together in the same room for the first time, gawping at each other like cretins and wondering how the hell they belong in the same party. What he wanted to do was not go after the little guys. He wanted to go after the big guy. What he wanted to do was illustrate, if possible through Hitler's own testimony, that what these stormtroopers were doing on occasions like the attack on the Eden Dance Palace was a calculated political strategy coming on orders from Hitler. He wanted to prove that the SA attack on the Eden Palace was a logical part of the systematic use of violence by the National Socialist Party. And to call Hitler um, was, yeah, was something else. It, was, it, it, it gave the whole, the whole scene um, a significance which it wouldn't have had before. The big day was the 8th of May, 1931. The Central Criminal Court in Berlin stood poised to welcome Adolf Hitler. I think everybody was concerned about the importance of this day, of, of this moment. People used to look out of their windows for, for hours before because they knew Hitler is coming. This was so exciting to, to know that he was being summoned. You have to imagine there were thousands of stormtroopers up and down Turmstrasse here and in the side streets. And there were several hundred police officers too trying to keep control of them. As the morning wore on, the stormtroopers were chanting, they were yelling, Sieg Heil, eagerly awaiting the appearance of Hitler. Echoing off the buildings, echoing off the court here, it would have been deafening.
One of the things Lytton wanted to do with the Eden Downs Palace trial was to put Hitler into a dilemma in which anything he said was going to hurt him. Witness his name? Adolf Hitler. I call on witness Adolf Hitler. The court calls witness Hitler. Either Hitler would have to go on the stand and say, our party is legal, which Lytton knew would raise a serious threat of a rift between the stormtroopers and the political organization of the Nazi party. Or he would have to embrace what the SA was doing and say, yes, this is what our party is about. And therefore, he would lose the middle class voters he was trying so hard to get. Herr Hitler, let me ask you this. What is the purpose of this essay? It is the party's sports section. It gives classes in self-defense. Jiu-jitsu. <laughs> I do not know the entire curriculum. It is possible, jiu-jitsu. And these two men, these students of jiu-jitsu, their vicious attack on the Eden Palace dance hall, was that self-defense? Your Honor. Hitler was not used to this role of being a witness and being within this framework of the criminal procedure. Whereas Lytton was a very high-skilled criminal lawyer, so he was, he was well prepared and he worked with the, with the rules of the criminal procedures. Uh, and this was what, what drove Hitler crazy. Lawyer's trick. I beg your pardon. A typical trick. His kind trade in cunning and deception. That is a complaint about me, or perhaps my entire profession. In the anti-Semitic fantasy, lawyers are Jewish. <laughs> I mean, the lawyers is a typical Jewish um, profession, and so in Hans Litten, those two anti-Semitic images converge. I don't think that Hitler was able to perceive a personality behind the Jewish lawyer. You do not decide the destinies of a nation with... For three hours, Hans Litten dragged Adolf Hitler from one violent Nazi action to the next. What you mean, people, and you say... But his masterstroke was to turn to the life and works of Joseph Goebbels, the man running Hitler's Berlin operation. Goebbels had written a pamphlet in which he essentially advocated a violent takeover by the Nazis of the German government. And this pamphlet had been printed by the Nazi party's official publisher and bore the party stamp and all of that. In the pamphlet, Nazi Sotzi, pages 18 to 19, he answers the specific question of what would happen if the Nazis had the street fighters on their side, but not the majority of the German people. We will clench our teeth and prepare ourselves, he says. Then we will march against the state and become revolutionaries indeed. We will chase the parliament to the devil and base the state on the strength of German fists. I ask you, Herr Hitler, is all that a metaphor as well? At the Eden Dance Palace trial, Hans Litten showed Germany who Hitler really was. Afterwards, it was no longer possible for an adult German to pretend that the Nazi party was either a party of the law-abiding middle classes or that it was a party of violent stormtroopers. It was clearly both. Litten believed Hitler would be crippled by this revelation. Hitler never forgot his ordeal. He was wounded profoundly this day. Unfortunately, it was not strong enough to make him getting a heart attack right now here in this place. That would be great. It was not strong enough so that he unfortunately could go on, fulfill his terrible dream of big Germany. It soon dawned on Hans Litten and his friends that Hitler's respectable supporters had not been swayed by the trial. They were prepared to overlook his violence, and in the following months, Hitler's star continued to rise. By 1933, he was worth 11 and a half million votes, and conservative politicians of the Weimar Republic began to court him. Believing that they could hire Hitler and that office would tame him, he was invited to join the cabinet, and with the blessing of the great and the good, was sworn in as Reich Chancellor on January the 30th, 1933. That night, the stormtroopers gathered in the heart of Berlin. 
They gathered as if to say, this is our city now. Hans Litten, Max and Margot Furst, any German who had raised their voice against the Nazi party were now trying to guess what came next. But you always have to imagine nobody could really think of what would go on after 33. Nobody. The communists didn't know this, the social democrats. <laughs> It's very easy, I think, for us to see in retrospect that Hans Litten should have read the signs and gotten out. But that is, of course, retrospect. It's virtually inconceivable to anyone who was there at the time that things were going to develop the way they were. What's this? Open it. Paris. Well, thank you, Rudolf, but I cannot go. Give me a he scene. couldn't. It's Hans. He couldn't do it. He really couldn't do it. He always said, as far as I know, that he couldn't leave his clients, that he couldn't. He couldn't let them um, on their own. He felt guilty. He no guilty. He responsible for them. If you are working as a lawyer, you live here. You have your job. You have your clients. I think for Hans Litten it was absurd. The idea of leaving the country, leaving his uh, clients was absurd, so he stayed. February 27th, 1933. Across the city, rumors were circulating that the Reichstag building, housing the German parliament, was on fire. Why and how this had happened, nobody yet knew. But it was clear to all that someone would have to pay. For most of its people, the Berlin night of February the 27th was like any other Berlin night. But in the working class districts, it was like no other. Into these areas, the stormtroopers came, and now they were carrying police badges. Hitler had decided that the Reichstag had been set alight by the Communist Party, and so here was the chance to crush them once and for all. Most of the leaders living here in our neighborhood, they were arrested. They were taken by the SA. The SA was, was um, uh, like a police. Goering said, you have the same rights as a police, and they walked together. It was just revenge. Da waren unsere Genossen raus hier geholt, in Folterkellern, und viele ausschlagen, ja, viele ausschlagen. Ich habe ihn, ja, der liegt ein Fürschergrankenhaus, auf ihm er ruft in Rudi. Where should all these poor workers go to? Most of them were unemployed. They didn't have money to buy a railway ticket to Switzerland or wherever. They had to stay here. To stay in Germany, as Hans Litten did, now meant trying to exist without the protection of a constitution. Even as the fires were burning in the Reichstag, the Nazis took the first significant step towards creating a totalitarian state. Here you see the Reichstag, the German House of Parliament in Berlin, which has been seriously destroyed by fire. The main hall in which the deputies conducted their debates has suffered...
from the conflagration. Hitler, now Chancellor, has announced that the fire was the work of communists. In consequence, Germany has been placed under a system of martial law, a decree having been signed which aims at the total destruction of communism. The decree for the protection of people and state, as it was called, allowed the Nazis to use the police to round up their chief political opponents. Hans Litten was one of them. He was arrested and taken to Alexanderplatz police station. For some communists, it was an advantage to be arrested by policemen. Hans Litten was arrested by police, so he was quite lucky, quite lucky. Nobody really knew at that time what would happen now. I mean, people, I mean, even Max Fürst were not so, he, they were, the, and Margot, were not so worried because it was something that had happened before and the police was not as bad as the SA. But the regular police had hands only for a short time. By March 1933, the man who put Hitler in the dock was handed over to the SA. He had not been charged with a crime. He never would be charged. Very few political prisoners were. He and the men around him were being held in protective custody. Protective custody, or the German word Schutzhaft, was a euphemism that the Nazis used to describe what they were doing to their political opponents. The Nazis' cynical message was they were only taking these endangered people into custody to protect them from what might happen to them outside from the wrath of the people if they were uh, out and free. When, of course, that's utter nonsense. They were arresting them to neutralize them politically. Before Auschwitz, before Treblinka, before Bergen-Belsen and Dachau, the name that summoned the horror of Nazi rule was Sonnenberg. 30 miles east of Berlin, on the site of an old penitentiary, a concentration camp, a new word in Germany, had been founded. On the 6th of April, 1933, Hans Litten was sent there. Artists, intellectuals, lawyers, trade union leaders, they could all be found at Sonnenberg. And the place was run by Storm 33. Hans was put into the hands of his worst enemies. Not only in the hands of the SA, but in the hand of exactly those people that he had been fighting against in court. So, that in the famous SA Storm 33. So that was really private revenge that happened then. It's safe to say that of anybody at all that the members of Storm 33 hated, Hans Litten had to be right at the top of their list. So unbelievable, I mean, what they did to him. And not only to him, to all these intellectuals, but I think really especially to him. He was beaten so that one of his eyes was damaged and he almost couldn't see out of it and the bones were broken. His skull, his mother reported, was somewhat misshapen. Um, terrible things had happened to him. His whole face was swollen. It was torturing, humiliating, beating, not right on killing him. That would be too easy. He really had to go to the most horrible of torture. Some SA men entered my son's cell at night, saying, now you are going to be shot. You will be photographed as the shots are fired. A revolver was pressed against each temple. The flashlight was ignited. The shutter clicked, but no shots fired. With such jests, the SA men amused themselves for hours, even for days. I think the shock was very big because being, even if you despise the legal system of the bourgeois state, you still had a legal system. And people had been raised in it and had studied it and had lived in it and had believed in it. And all this was gone within weeks. And even when you were beaten up by someone, there was no one to appeal to. Irmgard Litten tried to appeal, but she had to find out that all this had vanished within weeks. 
So I think that was a real shock to be unprotected suddenly. And she was so incredible. She went to, I don't know how many people, to, to help Hans out of this situation or to at least make his life a little less horrible. But nothing, nothing worked on because everybody told her, even, even people who, who said, yes, we would like to help, they said, we can't. The moment we mention the name of Lytton, no, it's, it's, we can't do anything for you. Five weeks after Hans's imprisonment at Zonenberg, the Nazis boasted to the world that they were book burners. On May the 10th, 1933, in Openplatz, in the center of Berlin, a highly publicized event was staged in front of cameras by the new regime. A country existing without the rule of law now decided it had no need for the written word. Ich bin hingegangen, weil ich hoffte, dass auch andere aus dem Bund hinkommen würden. Und so war es ja auch. Jeder hat gedacht, na ja, ich werde da noch frühere Genossen treffen. Over 40,000 books had been collected by the Berlin SA. Books whose words or whose authors offended the Nazi mind. Each one was committed to the flames. Die Leute die waren auf Matzen geklettert, um was sehen zu können. Und Militärkapelle intonierte Volk ans Gewehr und solche Sachen, solche Lieder. Also es war eine fürchterliche Atmosphäre und die Bücher wurden unter Schmährufen ins Feuer geworfen. Die Bücher haben sie wohl aus Bibliotheken gerissen. Und immer neue Lastwagen kamen voll beladen mit Büchern. Und Goebbels kam, der sich auch daran natürlich beteiligte. Meine Kommilitonen, deutsche Männer und Frauen, das Zeitalter eines überspitzten jüdischen Intellektualismus ist nun zu Ende. Und deshalb tu dir gut daran, um diese mitternächtige Stunde den Ungeist der Vergangenheit den Flammen anzuvertrauen. Also wir, nachdem wir uns gefunden haben, haben sehr schnell das Weite gesucht, weil wir das gar nicht mehr ertragen konnten, das mit anzusehen. Now there is a monument to that, and it is an extremely poignant and powerful one. If you walk along the square in Babelplatz, formerly Openplatz, where the book burning took place, you will come to a glass opening in the square, and you look below ground, what you see is empty bookshelves. That too, in a sense, captures what the Nazis were about, empty bookshelves. The books were burned, the life of the mind is gone. The life of the mind has been expunged from Germany. Ich will da gar nicht, gar nicht mehr daran denken. Wherever books are burned by civil or military governments, women gather outside the headquarters of the secret police and demand to know where their missing children are. In 1933, 
Irmgard Litten became a familiar face outside the Gestapo headquarters in Berlin. Irmgard Litten, Hans's mother, was a remarkable person in her own right, incredibly brave, incredibly stubborn, incredibly determined. And she would pitch herself in a certain way. She would write, for instance, I am a German mother for whom the fatherland means more than anything else. She would very much downplay Lytton's politics. In fact, she would say he was not politically motivated at all. To get him out, she would have done anything, anything. She was a person who taught her children not to lie, to always to say the truth. Whatever you do, not to sell your soul. But she realized that she had to play their game. So she raised up her hand and she shouted Heil Hitler, but with a smile, with an inner smile. She was smiling in their face with the attitude of, okay, you never will know what I'm thinking. If the Nazis ever come to power, Hans Litten had said during the trial, they will reduce the law to the whim of one man. This is now what happened. Independent organizations were banned. Hitler was exalted. The party is Hitler. Hitler aber is Deutschland. Wie Deutschland Hitler is. Hitler, Sieg! Sieg! And the party anthem, written by a recently murdered stormtrooper from Berlin, became a national anthem for the whole of Germany. Horst Wessel was the dead man's name. The anthem, the Horst Wessel song. Horst Wessel. The first draft of prisoners, including Lytton, were being taken to the prison at Sonnenburg. The guards amused themselves by making these left-leaning men sing the Nazi anthem, the Horst Wessel song. Everything about the Nazis was primitive. Their treatment of prisoners, the kind of symbolism of making their defeated enemies sing their own songs. And if they refused to sing, they were beaten. The Nazis would continue to sing their hymns to the SA. But in April 1934, Hitler murdered their leaders. Hans Litten's old adversaries were liquidated, their functions handed over to the SS, a less volatile organization. Their violence was rooted in law and sanctioned by the courts. The SS also took control of the concentration camps, as Hans Litten discovered when he was shifted to Lichtenberg camp. Hans Litten kam am 13. Juni 1934 in die Lichtenburg. Er musste, wie alle Häftlinge, die Begrüßungszeremonie über sich ergehen lassen. Die Neuankömmlinge wurden an der Kirche vorbei auf diesen hinteren Platz getrieben. Überall hatten sich SS-Leute versteckt gehabt, die den Häftlingen äh, quasi erschreckten, mit Knüppeln schliegen, äh, schlugen und äh, ihnen Beine stellten. Die jüngeren Häftlinge hatten, ähm, oder kräftigen Häftlinge hatten halt die Möglichkeit, ähm, schnell diesen Schlägen halt zu entkommen. Kriegsbeschädigte oder ähm, anderweitig äh, behinderte Leute wie Hans Litten, ähm, denen ging es sehr schlecht. Auf die wurde natürlich dann massiv eingeprügelt, bis sie dann halt weitergehen äh, konnten. Mein Vater war Häftling hier in der Lichtenburg und lernte auch den Hans. Der Hans war ja hier auch äh, Häftling. Mein Vater hat viel von dem Hans gesprochen. Da. Und im Keller, so viel ich weiß, diese Zeichnung von Hans gemacht. 
Sie waren vielleicht auch auf einer Wellenlänge. Und mein Vater sagte uns später, er wusste, dass der Hans ein Todeskandidat ist, weil er ja Hitler der Lüge überführt hat in einem Prozess. Er wusste, dass er nicht wieder heil rauskommt. Und das wusste aber auch seine Mutter. Später haben wir das erfahren. The principle of hope drove her on and in front of the Gestapo, she said, all the world knows what happens concerning torture and your political um, prisoners. They told her, you better didn't say this. We didn't understand this, what you were saying. And she said, then I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it and I'll repeat it and I'll repeat it that this is something that is, is against all the human dignity, what, what you are going to do, and the world has to know it, and if you don't stop it, I will tell them. But Hans, offended, offended, wounded Hitler in a way he never ever could forgive. Vast crowds now attended all Hitler's public appearances. They were some of the strangest crowds ever seen. Not a soul heckled. Everyone saluted. None were exempt. Only the brave said no. Montags mussten sie alle antreten draußen. Und dann mussten sie singen, das Horst Wessel Lied dann. Das habe ich nicht immer. Ich habe weder mitgesungen, noch nebenbei gesagt kam die Lehrer, die auch mein Zeichenlehrer besonders, der meinen Vater kannte. Und der dann Hildegard, du brauchst doch, wenn, heb doch die Hand, du brauchst ja nicht mitsingen. Ich sage, singe sowieso nicht. Und die Hand hebe ich auch nicht. Was wollten sie machen? Nach Herr Moskau. Hier gerufen. Im Abschied. In the trial, Hans Litten had predicted that the life of the mind would be obliterated if Hitler ever came to power, and that without the rule of law, independent thought would be extinguished. These things are durable in human beings, however. At Lichtenberg, even an SS officer reported that Hans was a miracle of learning. At Lichtenberg, Hans Litten was given a job as a bookbinder, and he ran a library, and he worked away on very erudite projects like a translation into modern German of medieval German poetry. He wanted to produce a book that would be a reader for uh, high school students on medieval German poetry, but rendered into a modern German that would be more comprehensible to young people. Wir befinden uns jetzt im Keller des Zellengebäudes. Hier hat sich vermutlich die Buchbinderei befunden. Hier hat Hans Litten mit anderen Häftlingen gearbeitet. Es war ein kleines Arbeitskommando gewesen, was die Buchbinderei selbst gemacht hat. Das ist uns nicht ähm, bekannt, wie sich das ähm, ursprünglich dargestellt hat, ob die Buchbinderei sich jetzt äh, überall befunden hat oder nur in einem Teil, ob das separiert war. Wie, gesagt, wie es eingerichtet war, ist eben nicht bekannt. Hans Litten hat sich ganz viele Bücher von seiner Mutter hier reinschicken lassen und die dann zum in die Lagerbibliothek aufgenommen wurden. He couldn't get books about politics or things like that. Nobody said anything about art. Probably modern art he couldn't get, so he got the other art. But art was art, so he used it. And he had something to hope for because it art gives hope. This was really Lytton resisting the Nazis as best he could, even within the walls of a concentration camp. 
By living the life of the mind in this very determined way, that in itself is one of the most anti-Nazi things you can do, precisely because the Nazis were so anti-intellectual. The 20th of April, 1935, was Adolf Hitler's 46th birthday, and all Germany was expected to celebrate. At Lichtenberg, the prisoners were each ordered to produce something lovely to commemorate the great day. Hans Litten's choice was lovely. All around them, there are the guards. You have to imagine SS men in black, and of course, with guns, the prisoners are supposed to present something. What did Lytton decide to do? He decided to read a poem called Thoughts Are Free, Die Gedanken sind frei. Die Gedanken sind frei. Wer kann sie erahnen? Sie fliehen vorbei wie nächtliche Schatten. Kein Mensch kann sie wissen, kein Jäger erschießen. Es bleibt dabei, die Gedanken sind frei. Ich denke, was ich will und was mich beglücket, doch alles in der Still und wie es sich schicket. Mein Wunsch und Begehren kann niemand mir wehren. Es bleibt dabei, die Gedanken sind frei. Und sperrt man mich ein in düsteren Kerker, das alles sind rein vergebliche Werke. Denn meine Gedanken zerreißen die Mauern und Schranken in zwei. Die Gedanken sind frei. Ich liebe den Wein, mein Mädchen vor allem. Sie tut mir allein am besten gefallen. Ich bin nicht alleine bei meinem Glas Weine. Mein Mädchen dabei, die Gedanken sind frei. By February 1936, Hans had been Hitler's prisoner for three years. And in that year, Irmgard Litten made a last desperate bid to persuade the dictator to release her son. She looked to Britain. She was able to get a very prominent group of British politicians to write a petition to Hitler asking that Litten be freed. And the reply is a very long example of Nazi propaganda in which Perhaps the most absurd claim is that the Nazi revolution would be seen in later years as a model revolution such as can only be carried out by a people at the very highest level of culture. And he went on to say that because Lyndon was such a dangerous communist, it would be far too dangerous to let him out. Um, the headline with which this was published in the German press sums it up. Lyndon is staying where he is. Hitler had taken a brilliant young lawyer, a man who warned his country against fascism, a man deeply loved by other people, and utterly destroyed him. And in October 1937, Hans was moved again, this time to Dachau. Irmgard Litten was permitted to visit him there. She had not seen her son for three years. It is like a small fortified city. A long wide street runs through the middle of it, and on either side are long barracks. It was like a street of the dead. I saw only one prisoner. He was cleaning a window, and an armed sentry was standing by him. A cart came towards us. It was being pushed by about a dozen prisoners. One man stared at me as though I were an apparition. When Hans was brought before his mother, she saw for the first time that a yellow star had been stitched onto his prison uniform. She saw that he had to wear the Jewish star. In the eyes of the SS, as having a Jewish father, they said he's also a Jew because his blood is Jewish. He was registered as a Jewish prisoner, 
and he was treated as like as the other Jewish prisoners and they were treated even worse than the other prisoners in the whole concentration camp. He was isolated with the other Jewish prisoners. One prisoner wrote, the wind blew from a different direction in Dachau. The guards were that much more brutal. In a sense, the guards had succeeded in breaking down the solidarity of some of the prisoners. Dachau was, at that time, significantly worse, significantly harsher for prisoners than any of the other concentration camps. They were not allowed to touch each other, to take, to, to embrace Hans. She had to be separated. There was a table between them and an SS guy watching everything. She only saw his hat. She, she felt he, he hardly couldn't speak anymore. His eyes were not shiny, shining anymore. And he made a, a remark that she afterwards knew. It was his bye-bye. But still there, in the big isolation, they had no newspapers, no books, nothing anymore. He was reciting hours and hours and hours to the other prisoners, Rilke poetry by heart, and just make them forget for a few minutes. He must have grown so big and so strong. That is really something that touches me even more than, than his fight against Hitler. Because to, to keep your dignity in such a circumstance by having no teeth left because they kicked out, by being almost blind because they hit you so often, having your legs broken several times, having big heart problems. He shared everything he had because he always said, it's not necessary for me. I've got my poems. On February the 5th, 1938, Hans was sent for interrogation. He was accused of concealing important information about a fellow prisoner. Thoughts are free but the SS now set about beating them out of him. That night, knowing he could stand no more, Hans ended his own life. You would find the Hans Littens in Argentina in the 70s, when 200 lawyers were killed uh, by, the, by the dictatorships. You will find them in Chile, you will find later on in Colombia, in Mexico. In Syria, maybe. <laughs> it comes to my mind first. I mean, we have so many countries um, with uh, oppression and uh, political persecution. I mean, you can pick many countries, I would say. Perhaps we would find uh, people like this in Russia. Uh, there are lawyers like this who carry on human rights advocacy in countries like Iran. Any country where there is a problematic government, we hope at least that perhaps there will be a brave lawyer like Lytton to come forward and challenge them. <laughs>